You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 109, part one. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and foes, I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. The Artist Athlete Podcast comes to you with the generous donations of my amazing Patreons. Patreon is a website that allows creators like me to get donations from listeners like you who love my work and want to support it. If you love what you're listening to each and every week, go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete. Patreons get special behind-the-scenes looks at all the podcasts, including an entire video interview of the podcast that you are about to listen to today. Patreons can not only hear it, they can see it. They get stickers, advanced purchases, sales on lots of artist-athlete swag, and so much more. So go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete today. My guest today is Francisco Cruz. And before I even read Francisco Cruz's bio, I just want to uh, reconcile one thing with a lot of my listeners. A lot of y'all I know are really interested in stories of circus artists who started later in life, people who started at the age of in their 20s or even 30s and went on to have a really successful circus career or a career that defined the way they wanted to live through circus. And that is not Francisco Cruz's story at all. He began at the age of seven. However, I think that if you listen to his story, what you'll start to realize is it doesn't matter what age you start circus, there's always going to be that struggle, that question, that wondering of how do I fit in in the circus community and how does my passion, my skills, my talent, um, on the outside it may seem obvious, like I can flip around and do cool stuff, so I'm a circus performer. But there's so much more that goes in to the circus industry. And that's what Francisco discovers and talks about throughout this interview. So while on the outset, it may be hard for you to relate to someone who started circus at the age of seven, I want you to give this story a chance anyway. A lot of you all will listen to this because you know Francisco Cruz. You know that the impact that he has had on, especially Montreal Circus, has been incredible. But if you don't know him personally, you don't know the story, listen in, because I think it's a lot more relatable than you could imagine. So here's his bio. Francisco Cruz began circus at the age of seven at the San Francisco Circus Center in California, taught by Master Lu Yi, one of the great circus trainers and teachers in America. From the moment he started, he quickly fell in love with the idea of flipping and tumbling for the rest of his life. When Francisco was 12, he was able to go on his first cross-country tour with the New Pickle Circus. In 2002, Francisco moved to Canada to pursue his love of circus by attending the National Circus School of Montreal. Upon graduation, Francisco joined with Les Sept Doigts de Main, The Seven Fingers, to perform in the original cast of the show Traces, which he toured internationally for over five years. Looking to discover another side of his circus career, in 2010, Francisco and his wife moved to the Netherlands to be the acrobatic director of Circus at Codarts, a world-renowned arts university. Presently, Francisco has since returned to Montreal to again join Les Edouard de Main behind the scenes as an associate artistic director. Francisco currently lives in Montreal with his wife and his two daughters and can be seen skateboarding through the summer in the streets of Montreal. Before I begin this interview, there is one more thing I want to say Francisco has so many stories and we talked for so long that his interview is split into two parts. So this week will be part one and then part two will air next week. Both of these episodes, 
Francisco and I wanted to dedicate to Francisco's brother, who he mentions often in the interview, Rafael Cruz. Francisco calls him Raf. Raf passed away in 2018 at the age of 31, but he is still very much a part of Francisco's life and the lives of many for his spirit and his contributions to the industry. You'll hear a bit more about Raf next week, but this week and every week, we want to honor his memory. Now, here's part one of my interview with Francisco Cruz. I don't know. Maybe we'll do like a, a Patreon only on traces or maybe I'll just, I don't know. <laughs> but we should talk about it. It was like, what? Tell me about traces. <laughs> Ever heard of the urban acrobats? <laughs> <laughs> nah, traces was like insane. It was insane. I mean, it was a show was from also, the Seven Fingers. Yeah, a show from Seven Fingers. And I mean, again, it just has to, like, I got to say that was like a dream show. Like, like for us, you know, everything we had experienced as kids, you know, the skateboarding, the music and, you know, just like San Francisco and, and then going to Montreal and having that experience there. And then for basically make that when we made that urban acrobat video, you know, big shout out to Ben Philippi because he's the one that uh, filmed us and made that. And he did like an insane job and it was exactly what sort of we envisioned um, with all the skits and stuff. And, and so when Gypsy and Shayna saw that and also knew us from kids, you know, and after Gypsy, you know, for me personally, I, I really feel like that walk don't walk was the first taste of traces for sure that Gypsy had made for us. And, and so when Gypsy and Shayna, we had this idea that we were going to put that promo out there and, and see what happened. Um, and the fingers were like the first to be like, yo, like, like you have a vibe here and we like it and we're stoked on it. And we're going to create a concept around that vibe. And they approached us and, and Gypsy had this whole thing where she sort of wrote like, you know, at the end traces, it's about leaving your trace in the world. So like when it comes down to it, you're stuck in a bunker. Um, you have this to say, what? what are you going to say? What is going to be your traces on the world? You know? Um, and that concept perfectly aligned with like, you know, skateboarding on stage, playing piano on stage, you know, Raf played like a guitar song on stage. Uh, we talked, we said who we were, we said actual facts about us. You know, I had like a whole list of cereals cause I'm addicted to cereal still to this day. Um, so I had this whole list of cereals and I said that on stage and, and for us, we're like, holy shit. Like not only are they celebrating us, like, you know, what I, what I said earlier about celebrating the artists, but now they want us to like speak that, you know, uh, to an audience and share like who we are and, and share fact, like what, you know, how tall I am, how much I weigh, how much this. The... So I think traces was like. Like we were tripping in the fact that like we were told to bring our skateboards to work every day, you know, <laughs> that we were being asked to like make piano propositions. And again, it sort of reiterated what I had experienced in Walk Don't Walk of like, we were making playlists to bring into the creation room. We were, you know, the artists and they wanted that and they wanted more of it and they were like loving it and feeding off of it. And then obviously you know, we're not wearing baggy jeans on stage, but they took our energy and they were able to like make this sort of world in this bunker and, you know, with the sort of clothes we were wearing and like, we felt so good and comfortable in that setting and on that stage. Like at one point it was funny because like we had such a good dynamic, us cast I and mean, Gypsy and Shayna, because, you know, we're all from the Bay, except Eloise, Eloise is French, but like we all had this sort of communication where we're like just like lo we loved creating traces like it was so fun me and my brother and brad and will we always had this thing growing up too when we were in san francisco called the joke hole where it's just like you make a, a joke and then you just like dive down and you take the joke as far as it can go and we're just like <laughs> laughing and dying like just so funny and it was like that it's like we just had these joke holes and just like it was fun and and challenging you know like the acting part of it was really challenging because we hadn't we had, you know, in classes um, in ENC, but, you know, this is different because now we're on stage 
um, and we're about to go full force into whatever traces was going to be. Um, and so we, we created it in about three months uh, and we, we had a show and we we're going to play at the Corona Theater. Um, I know Corona Theater, oddly enough. <laughs> Read the room. <laughs> wow. Uh, so we're going to play at the Corona Theater. And all of a sudden I remember it was like, I think it was like the a night before, maybe it was in the day of, and we were like, shit, like, are people going to like this? Like, did we make a show just for us? <laughs> you know, because like when you make yeah, a show sure, about yeah. you as a person, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you're risking a lot because if they don't like it, it means they don't like me. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what that means. Yeah. So that was like, that was sketchy. Like that, even Gypsy and Shane at one point, they were like, you know, I remember Gypsy telling me years later, she's like, did I just fail them? Like, did I just oh. have them put themselves on stage and share all these things, you know, like real things about them? Like, what does that mean for me as a director if the, if people don't like it? You know what I mean? Um, so they really took care of, of that and really paid attention to like wanting to put us in our best light. Um, but we, I mean, we trusted it. We trusted the process. We, I mean, honestly, we just had a blast together. Like the five of us, like, like I said, like even warming up before a show for us and traces was like, all right, let's play a game of skate. Let's play some piano. Let's play some guitar. Like the last thing we were doing was warming up technique, you know, which was <laughs> kind of dangerous too. Cause we were like having too much fun, you know, that's fine. And that show is not light on technique. <sighs> No, it's really not light. I know we put every single trick we could possibly put in that I show. I don't really know how you're um, still walking, actually. Like, what was like? <laughs> yeah, well, so anyway. that's the thing. So then, so then we 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 start at the Corona Theater, and you know we play it, and people are like, "Damn, that was amazing!" But it was like people weren't sure if it was like groundbreaking or anything, but they were like, "Wow, like you guys put a lot in there. Like that's insane. Cool, like." like bravo you know and then we took it to france um i think it's saint sur mer is where we first played it um and they didn't like it at all they hated okay. it and we were like shit like what do we do like i don't i don't maybe it's just not the right audience maybe we made it too american because we're all americans you know except eloise but let's just keep going kept plugging away and sure enough like at some point it just clicked that people were like, this is a show for the next generation. This was a show that like teenagers could relate to as well as like people outside of circus, because we were doing things that were relatable. Like the fact that we were skateboarding and playing piano and, and playing guitar and speaking about things that are personal to us, you know, the amount of times I said my final line of cereal saying, and my favorite cinnamon toast crunch, I'd get like hollers from the audience, just like, yeah, me too. You know? And so once that clicked of like, we're relating to like us, like me, Francisco, like all of a sudden, like I'm speaking to me out there, you know, who was looking for a circus that reflected what I liked and reflected what I thought was cool um that translated um and sure enough like people just ate it up like they thought it was so amazing that like we were you know that the fingers were able to bring that out of us and that we were able to share that with the public and communicate that and get that message across um that this was a circus to to reflect what we like us as artists like this sort of new generation that like it just took off after that like we ended up like our tours were nuts like we were doing you know new zealand one month australia the next month japan italy you know we did a stint in cyprus we were going all over the place and what was awesome was that the fingers were like fully in it in the sense that you know this is their second creation and they decided not to put themselves in the show so that was a huge step for them to sort of like work like a company that creates doesn't matter who's on stage doesn't have to be us like right and so for them to put all right. their cards in that basket for us and just be like yo like traces is it like this is the next this is our next show and then for them just to put that out there and we played you know so they were trying to open a lot of doors with with traces and so that's why i said like a lot of the tours were ridiculous because they didn't make any sense like we'd go to france come back to montreal but then the producers that were there in France might've been from Italy or might've been from, you know, 
uh, right. London or whatever, and they would see it and they'd be like, yo, we want that too. So we'd like go back to Europe, then come back and then go. So we were doing these crazy little two week stints wow. everywhere just to like, you know, establish like this is what the fingers are as a company. But then this is also a vision that the company has of circus. And, and what blows is- my mind about it is like, you didn't like, <laughs> of course, like this is something it only works in retrospect, right? Like you didn't know that traces was going to be traces. Not at all. I, yeah. Not at all. I mean, yeah. like you would ask me when we were doing traces, like, we're like, yeah, it's a fun show. Like, it's sick. It's super fun to do. I can't believe they're letting a skateboard on stage. Like, that was huge for us. I think the skateboarding <laughs> thing was huge. I know I keep saying that, but I think It's such a huge us, part like, of the show, too, you know? Like, when you need replacements or when you need... But I think the fact that they, like... Like, like they allowed us to put skateboarding on the stage. I mean, they told us to put skateboarding on the show. And we're like, really? Like, no. Like, not real. No, no. And they're like, no, we want you to put skateboarding... Like, we're going to have you skateboard in the show. And, like, our minds were blown that that was allowed. You know, so much of circus is, like, or any art form, right? They have those rules or the unwritten rules of, like, what's allowed, what's not allowed for your peer group. And when they were, Mm. like, telling us, like, no, like, why why, why can't we put skateboarding on stage? And we're like, I don't know. I, I guess we can then. Sure. You know, and that was, like, for us, that was just such a, such like a, a like oh, okay i guess we'll just accept and we trust you so we're just, yeah we'll follow your lead and if you want us to skateboard we'll just do it we'll we'll put our skateboard we'll you know and we got to go shopping for new skateboards and brought them on stage and brought them all over the world with us so that actually that became an issue because all of a sudden every theater we went to the first thing we do is like skate around the hallways and in the lobby and you know and check out every city by skateboarding so they had to like tell us like okay you can chill on the skateboarding outside of the show <laughs> just like <laughs> be mindful <laughs> of like skateboarding is still pretty dangerous <laughs> we were like and basketball they put basketball on the show yeah right and so we're like why why are we doing it? why are we? and they're like because that's who you guys are and the audience will relate to that they'll they'll trust that what you're doing is genuine and honest and if you enjoy doing it they're going to relate to that they're going to relate even if they don't play basketball they relate to just the enjoyment that you have dribbling on stage and we were like cool all right (laughs) she even better (laughs) why not (laughs) it's crazy though when you say like you know like there are some things in the art form that like there's just like these unwritten rules and it's making me wonder like what are the unwritten rules now you know, like once you put skateboarding yeah. on stage, like what, what, like, you know, like I don't even know what's not allowed because you just kind of automatically rule it out. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'd be curious to, to sort of put a bunch of people together, just start doing like a survey of like what's allowed, what's not allowed. I'd right. be curious too. What's not allowed in circus. Or and what's then- like, like frowned upon. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I feel like there's things that sometimes you'll see a circus show and you'd be like, oh they did that but you know what I mean and you're like oh is that is that cheesy I mean when I think about that kind of stuff I think like okay like what don't I like is more than what like what don't I like I don't like it when there's a bunch of aerial acts in a row I don't like it when someone discovers their apparatus yeah or their discipline what else don't I like I don't know. There's not much I don't like. If you can do it well, I'll buy it. I'm well, pretty so much game thing. for anything. I mean, I think that that sort of goes back to what I was saying earlier of like, like I think it, it more comes down to who you are performing for more than what you like or don't like. Because, you know, let's say you really did like only aerial acts and that's the only thing you gravitated towards and you wanted to make a show that's only aerials. Well, there is an audience that exists for that. Mm-hmm. right so it, it really depends on okay so what is my intention right now with what i'm creating is it to please just myself because it's i only uh in tune with what i want to put on stage and that's the only thing i think is good and and i fully believe in that and i, I think that's amazing that a lot of artists do that they don't give a shit about the audience they're just like i'm gonna make what i make and it's gonna be amazing because i like it 
and I don't care what the audience thinks. Do you guys, is it that, cause that's kind of what it sounds like you did with traces. I mean, yeah, to a certain extent, <laughs> for sure. We, we yeah. loved it. I mean, I loved it as an artist. Um, I can't, like, it's been a while since I talked to Gypsy or Shane about it. I'm going to assume they really liked it too. <laughs> I would I um, it. So I think there is, I mean, I, I think that's where the balance comes in of like, when we were talking earlier about groundbreaking shows, I think that's where that balance comes in. It's like, you not only need to make something that you really love yourself and think is super cool and amazing. And like, this is the future of circus, but it also needs to be accessible to a larger audience and if it's not accessible and not relatable well now you're just making now now you're to a certain extent being selfish because you're just making this for yourself yeah you know what i mean it's such an interesting balance too because you can't just make things for the audience that well that's you know that's what they they say that's like selling out yeah right right? now you're making like some superficial only tricks and you're just doing it for the money and it's just for the audience but it's you know, just, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but I think for the community itself, that's like, you don't do that. <laughs> you no. know? Well, and I think, it, I mean, but like, also like we all have to pay rent and like eat and like, so we've got to like make things that people want to pay for to, for to see. Exactly. To and then, page. and then how much do you sacrifice of your vision to make like to 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 make something accessible for people to pay and show up for yeah you and what's so cool is when you have those like moments where and this is what traces i think it, like it was so cool is like yeah. the two just kind of melded together in a double healing yeah thing. i mean it worked out and and like i couldn't be more thankful for that experience like that was no i think that was what was so shocking to us was like the amount of people that would come up to us afterwards and be like spoke to me like you inspired me and even years later you know i got a comment a couple months ago from a base who's like you're the reason i do circus like traces is the reason i do circus like traces yeah. is the reason like that circus made sense to me for the first time mm. and the amount of people that have come up to me over the years you know like it's so humbling to me that i could have any sort of impact on somebody's career choice or somebody's life choice, you know, and, and to hear artists come up to me over the years saying that, like, like when I saw traces, like it, it made sense in, in the terms that like circus can be what you want. And I, and I like, and they believed in sort of their vision of circus because they saw traces. Hmm. Um, and it spoke to them. And, and to hear that as an artist, you know, years later, I mean, we created traces in 2005, you know, and to hear that over the years, it's like, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but now like, I'm so thankful that I was a part of that and I'm super humbled by that. I had any impact on anybody's like any artists sort of career choice, you know, or, or trajectory to what they are today. Um, so crazy thankful for that experience. Yeah. Sorry. My daughter just walked behind. Oh, hey. you good. You good. See ya. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna homeschool your kids? Are you gonna Are you gonna take them to a Lu Yi? Sorry, one second. I gotta open a banana. Yeah, bananas are important. Gotta get that. You want, you want to say hi? You can say hi. Hi. Here, come over this hi. side. Hi. 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 Can you hear me? Can she hear me? Or is it just in the headphones? No, no, she can't. That's uh. I'm what, Shannon. What is, Shannon, but it's, uh, I was gonna sorry, I was gonna say the artist athlete, but I was like, I'm, <laughs> that's not the artist athlete. I mean, it is the artist athlete, but not Shannon. I am an artist athlete, but I'm just Shannon. Oh, um, awesome. No, I'm not homeschooling them. Um, I went to. I mean, I think homeschooling was amazing. I'm super thankful that I was homeschooled, and I I think there's so many benefits to homeschooling. Uh, but after half after having gone to Concordia and learning what I did about about school and education i think there's there's a way to do both um and so we put actually my oldest daughter adeline we put her in an alternative school that's right next to my house so there's no home there's no homework there's no um there's no exams um and it's a nature school so they're outside every day like even during winter like they're always outside learning you know math and language through nature and so i just think like as much as i loved homeschool i think there's also you know, we were lucky. My parents recognized their sort of lack, not lack, but like 
their ability to only teach us so much themselves that they got us like tutors in various, you know, okay. subjects. Yeah. So we had a history teacher, we had a math teacher that we'd see like once a week to like really instill in us like uh, their passion for those subjects. Um, because they were like, yeah, no, I'm not the best mathematician. I'm not the best this. And I think it's important to like find teachers that are passionate about what they do to teach my child because that'll get them hyped on math if they're hyped on math. Does that make sense? So they, they did that. And so for me, I realized like as, a, as a, for homeschool today, I was like, you know what, if I can find a happy medium, then it's all the power to them because now they get experiences that they wouldn't have otherwise in homeschool but there's still the benefits of homeschool because you don't have the pressure that education puts on you um, as a Mm. little kid. And we were lucky. I mean, I I say that so many times how lucky I was, but like my mom really believed that like education is what you make out of it. So that means like for us, like skateboarding is a part of education, just like circus was a part of education, just like music was a part of education. And so like for math and language arts, stuff like that, like, if you're interested in it, go as far as you want. But if you're not interested in it, I'm not going to force feed you just so you can regurgitate the information for a test. Yeah. So what we did is we do school like three months a year. We basically to, for our homeschool program, we had to pass like a, a statewide exam to like go to the next grade. And so like three months before that exam, we'd like buy a bunch of books on how to pass that exam. <laughs> You'd like learn, cramp. yo, we'd learn all those subjects and everything I needed for that grade level, pass the test, and then we wouldn't touch school until, <laughs> <laughs> until the next exam. Well, you seem like you're doing all right for it. So, I, yeah, I, and I our parents were like, Yeah, but look how stoked they are. Like, they're pumped. Like, we're, you know, I, like we had our own education. Like I said, once we had our freedom, me and Raph, we'd like jump on the train in the morning. You know, like, I I think they allowed us to leave the house by ourselves at like, I think I was like 13 and my brother was 10 and we just like hop on, on on BART in Muni and like, just like jump to the city and and just go skate all day, go to circus class, like hang out with our friends after and then like come home at like nine at night. My parents were like, chill with that. I was like, all right, cool. This is amazing. (laughs) This is so sick. Um, Yeah. So it was, it was really a different kind of education that I had growing up. And I fully recognize like the power of being curious will take you super far. You know, like the fact that I was able to go to Concordia after being homeschooled. And that was my first experience in a classroom was like in university. You know, I even remember asking my wife, like, like, do you just put your hand up? And then that's how you ask a question. Like, how do you, and then I was like, I was (laughs) like, and you just, I know. For, but Damn. it was like my first experience in a school setting. And I was like, and I, I remember going, like getting notebooks and I had all my pens like laid out. And I was Did you so get it nervous. all color coded and stuff? And like, I, don't, I don't know if I got a color code, but I was like, green folder. I was so nervous to go in that like I made my wife come with me and like check out the classroom before I walked in. And I was like, where do I sit? Like, what does it mean if I sit over there? Like, how do I? Because I'm all my, all my knowledge of schooling came from like movies. Because I had no direct experience with like being in elementary school, being in high school, nothing, yeah. zero. Yeah. Crazy. So like I was super intimidated. And then like the best part was, was, you know, finally when I was like, okay, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to go, like, I'm going to walk into the classroom and my wife like observed from the corner because she thought it was hilarious. She thought it was so funny. So I ended up picking like a movie theater seat right in the middle. And like the professor opened up with a joke and I just like bust out laughing and I was just like, have this like one-on-one conversation. Like I felt like the, the teacher was there for me and I was just like having this like one-on-one conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, she like snuck in and like sat next to me and she's like, just chill. Like you're good. Like look around. And I looked around and every other student was like, you know, like sitting back in their chair, just like, Ugh. like we're in class. And I was like, Oh, that's true. It's funny. Like, what a classroom is like what education is and our mindset because for me like it was a choice to be there it wasn't a necessity absolutely yeah no I feel you. right just like yeah so that was like a a crazy realization of like I don't know like like we talked about rules like what are the rules of a classroom what are the rules of being a student anyways so that was like a crazy experience for me that whole 
that whole thing. No, that makes total sense. Cause when I was a little kid and I like, you know, like I went to school and did all that. And I was always fascinated by what happened when I went to school, like what happened in the world? Like what did everybody else do? Yeah. Like, and here I had, I didn't understand what school was at all. You know, I remember doing my first internship with a kindergarten class and I was like, I gotta be honest, like this is my first kindergarten class. Like you like went how, to kindergarten too, like for the yeah, first time. Well, that's it. As an intern, and I was tripping. I, I remember taking a picture of like the little cubby that the the teacher made for me, and I I sent it to my wife, and I was like, "Look, I got a little cubby. Like, I got my little setup here. Like, I know it's so cheesy." Wait a second, but you, though, you had classes at ENC, yeah? Like, didn't you guys have? I mean, school? not not really. Like, I we had some classes, but because I wasn't Canadian, we weren't required to do like the philosophy classes or anything like oh, that. Okay, like, the only exactly. classes I had was um was French class. And I think we did health. Yeah, we did a little bit of health too, but like it wasn't, I mean, it's ENC. So like, I remember sitting on the floor stretching during class. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really different. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the word for it. Yeah, it's different. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Why are we, why are we talk about that? I oh, cause know. you asked, you asked about my daughter. Oh yeah. I asked if she was being homeschooled and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's very cool. Anyways, Man, so um, traces then took off. This is what I wonder about traces or like yeah. what I wonder about that like model is it, it feels like a show that like only y'all can do. They had replacements. Yeah. Um, but like, what, what are your thoughts on this? Like we kind of talking and going back and forth about like, you know, like audience versus artist and how to make, find mm -hmm. the balance between like something the artist loves and wants to express. And then like what the audience wants to see, which is hopefully mm -hmm. like in the ideal world, the same thing. Totally. Um, but then when you're making a show like Traces, I feel like the other interesting thing about that show is like, it's so personal. So when that a person like leaves the cast or gets injured or like something happens, you know, like you have to bring someone in and how many times can you do that before it's like not Traces anymore? You know, like. Yeah, I mean, we the, the concept remained. They had a conversation with us. I remember actually like when we were sort of having our last legs of our final tour with traces and it was um they asked us like what do you what do you guys think about replacements for the show um which i thought was incredibly like um that's really cool i mean yeah yeah just for them to want to know our opinion on it especially because of how successful traces was doing it's kind of like well of course we're going to keep touring it because we're going to you know make money off this thing and it, again it's going to help the company but the fact that they sort of asked us like what do you think about it how do you feel if we were to replace you and i remember at first we were kind of like yeah nobody can do the show but us because like you said it's like it's so personal the show and and that was like a huge part of why traces was successful is because of how personal it was to the artist but at the end of the day i remember coming to a realization for myself personally of like yeah, but if, if if I'm getting all these messages back from people my age saying how incredible Chase's is and how it's speaking to them and inspiring them and motivating them, I was like, who am I to to stop that message? Like, regardless of who's on stage, even if it's a fraction of what it was originally, because, you know, not everybody can skateboard and... Not everybody play piano can play and basketball. do basketball. And yeah. And if they, and if they and keep it. some of those concepts and the message is still there by the end of the show, well then, yes, I want it to continue for as long as possible. Because if it's inspiring future circus artists, you know, or just inspiring future artists in general to sort of have that message of like, celebrate you, celebrate your vision, celebrate what you like doing. And I was like, hell yeah, like, go like have as many casts as you want go for it you know if you can make it work and and, you, and you're happy with the result i'm not gonna stand your way you know what i mean at all yeah. and i think it's an important message to get out there especially for when i looked back on myself as a teenager i i wished i had seen a show like that you know to affirm for me that my type of circus exists out there you know um so that was that's that's kind of where, where that ended up going. And I think in the end they did I wanna say like nine casts of it. Like we had wow. tons of different casts of it. And it was amazing. I mean, that was so fun because like obviously 
you know, a huge part of traces is the skateboarding and the basketball. And so like, you know, for producers and stuff, they love those things. So as much as it was like, you know, at some point it was thrown out there like, oh, how cool would it be to have every cast do what's good for them? So if they're into, you know, soccer or if they're into these other random things, like let's put that on stage. But then producers are like, no, like right. we want yeah, the basketball, yeah. we want the skateboarding. So, yeah. you know, you get a second cast, third cast, fourth cast. What's the first thing we got to start with? Skateboarding class. <laughs> basketball <laughs> class. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't teach you that at ENC, did they? And some artists were like, "No, like, mm. like you hired me for what I do. Like, you want me to skateboard? Then you know how dangerous that is. <laughs> you know, so, so like that's why at one point we had an artist. I'm not gonna say, say who he was, but he was like, "I don't want to skateboard. I'm gonna. Um, I, 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 there's no way. Like, it's way too dangerous." And so we let him roller skate on stage. And so then he introduced another, like, you know, for the skateboarding role or the skateboarding scene, um, starting in Traces 2 in the second cast, uh, like, we had a roller skater on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's cool. <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, why not? Well, I mean, like, yeah, and it, like, goes to the question of, like, when does it, like, is the idea behind Traces that it is like what the artist loves or is it that it has basketball, that it has skateboarding, that it has these elements. Yeah. And then if it's that, then like, I guess, I guess the opportunity is open that like any show that the fingers makes, if that's their process, like you're saying, it kind of sounds like it is and talking to other people, yeah. um, drawing from artist experience. Like that's kind of their model of like how to create a show is basically like, what do you love? Let's put it on stage. Yeah. I mean, they try to do that as much as possible within the sort of structure of the concept that they're creating, mm. you know, because um, obviously there are certain, you know, shows that we've done where it's like, it's very specific, the concept that we're going for. And so, yes, we will have to mold the artist into what we're trying to say or the message that we're trying to go for. Um, but I think for Traces, like, you know, there were certain things like, like I said earlier about, you know, the skateboarding, the basketball, like that was a huge part of traces those specific visuals of seeing the artist skateboarding on stage that like we couldn't get rid of that like that had to stay in the show because of sort of that statement that it was making that this is okay to do on stage in a circus show mind you all the disciplines changed throughout the years mm -hmm. depending on the artist so we didn't look for people who were necessarily hoop divers or pole climbers um but we looked for artists that sort of had the vibe of traces and then we like i said we had to teach them skateboarding basketball um piano i mean that so that was the thing so when i said like i moved to behind the scenes a lot of the behind the scenes for me in the beginning was teaching traces artists how to do skateboarding piano and basketball so like all my coaching were like pretty much those disciplines you became and a piano diving. teacher <laughs> i did a piano, like, piano teacher skateboarding teacher basketball teacher uh and then, you know, depending on the artist, like we had to do like hoop diving and pole climbing because those also stayed in the show for group acts. Um, and then individual acts changed a lot. So like we had hand balancers over the years, we had dance trapeze, we had straps, and we had various other disciplines. Are you, I, yeah. I talked to some people, I interview some people on the show, Louis West comes to mind. Who yeah, just Louis likes, West is insane. He's so good. But yeah. he just likes learning things. Like, he's just one yeah. of those people who, like, just picks up things and learns things. And I'm wondering with you, because you are so multifaceted, but also you started so young. Like, are you like mm -hmm. that? Like, do you just, like, pick up new things and, like, get into things? Or are you... I get really addicted to things, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, that's, like, the whole filming thing. Like I was okay. saying earlier, like, yeah, at yeah, one yeah. point when I decided, I was like, I made that little video for Dom. And then I was like, oh, filming's really cool. Finger said yes. Flash forward five years, like... I pretty much, I would say I make 90% of the visual content that comes out of the fingers. You know, I just finished nice. editing the, a full feature length film that the fingers released on Pam. Like we just released that through the coach last week. Um, and we're going to have future releases, you know, coming up in France and other places. So I do, I very much enjoy being a beginner at things mm. and then like forcing myself, not forcing myself, but like, like, I just, I want to, I, I like, I, I have this thing of like, okay, I picked up a camera. I was like, filming's really cool. And then I just start researching it. And then I just sort of like, for filming, especially like I got really addicted 
to an extent to where I was like, because I like skateboarding so much and because I grew up watching skate videos, I mean, I still watch skate videos today. I was like, I want to bring that to circus. I want to see circus filmed this way. And I want circus videos to be made this way. And I don't want them to be promos. I want them to have, you know, to, to make statements and I want them to be edited how I think it should be edited. And so because I wanted to do that and because I felt like circus, you know, a lot of circus videos that I see or circus content is very much about like, buy me, buy me, like buy my act. This is what I'm, I'm selling and not just videos for the sake of being a video you know, a film or having some sort of concept or, you know, filmed in yeah. a cool way totally. where I was like, what I was seeing in skateboarding was so cool and groundbreaking for me as a circus artist. I was like, I'm going to draw inspiration from that. And I'm going to go like, I want to go film circus that way. So that was basically my motivation. And then, and then I, like, I, like, like you said, Leah, like, yes, I do like to dive deep into things. So then I just start teaching myself. So like YouTube, Google, contacting out of the blue other videographers in Montreal like I cold call a lot of people just to shadow them till I can get what I'm seeing in my head out into the world or to a level that I think is like sufficient for me and satisfies my hunger to like get to a certain level of filmmaking that I think is you know good and even still I, I like like I have a thing where I'm very motivated to become better all the time at things because like I like practicing and I like rep repetition. And I think that just comes from like my childhood of like the, being in the circus and piano and all these things of like, I understood at early age that like, you don't, like you're not good at anything, but you can be really good at like the steps to get good at something, you know? So it's like all those little baby steps. I have a lot, of, I have a lot of fun doing. And I think because I have so much fun with each little baby step, like it's pretty much sure that I'm going to get good at it because I'm motivated to do the baby step. I'm motivated and, and I'm okay with not being good at stuff that I get good at stuff. <laughs> if that, does that make sense? That, that, makes, <laughs> that makes absolute total sense. No, 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 no. And it's like such a, um, yeah, it's something that I feel like people come across all the time. And really what it sounds like to me is like, you're not so outcome based. I'm not, into yeah, the process. no, it's true. It's true. I'm very much in the process. I mean, that's why like, which you know, is what you said, skills. like at the very beginning when you were talking about like, yeah, it doesn't matter if we make a five-star show, like every artist has to be into the process. I think we said, yeah, that. no, I fully stand by that. Right, I mean, that's one of the reasons I have random, you know, like when I was a kid, like I, I have like a second place trophy at a ping pong tournament because I got really into ping pong for a minute. <laughs> I did. I got super into it for a second. I was just like, I love ping pong. I want to be hella good at ping pong. It's so and good. Like, it's such a good summer sport in Montreal too. <laughs> there you go. Really you know, yeah. and then skateboarding, like I uh, just, I want to be good. Like, I want to be able to do these tricks. And then, you know, at one point, like I don't play video games, but I got really into this one video game to the point, like I also entered a tournament for this video game and just like random things that I was just like, I just, oh. I, just I want to keep going, you know, but it's, it's just for like a second. And then it's like, okay, I'm done with that. Like, Okay, now I'm interested in this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think it's just important. I mean, I, I think it's really important, especially now, like, when I became a dad, I was like, I want to instill in my kids, like, that hunger to learn stuff. Because at the end of the day, like, even I realized from that first class at Concordia, it's like, whatever shortcomings I had, if I had a hunger to learn it, and to learn how to write a paper, an essay, learn how to take an exam, if I had a hunger, I'm going to learn it hundred times faster than if I'm going to have somebody try to force it down my throat, Hundred percent, you know? And so it's like, if I could teach my kids how to have that hunger to like learn whatever, then they're set for life. You know, whatever shortcomings you feel you have, whatever goal you try to set in your head, it all starts with that like first step. You know what I mean? Like take a step, then you'll be good. You know? And if you can make that first step every day, you're that much closer to attaining whatever you set for yourself. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, so I just kind of want to show them that too, by like doing all my random little skills. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> so random, so random. I, I have know. a question for you about like filming circus. I love yeah. this. Like, I love this. I mean, I'm here for this passion that you're on this kick. Um, especially it seems super pertinent since the pandemic that yeah. like circus is kind of necessarily making a uh, like for, for way for, for Ray. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Like there it's trans it's you got to put it on film now. That's 
how yeah. people are watching it. And I think there's an interesting, like, not just promo, like you're saying, like people make promo to sell themselves or make a demo that's like yeah. kind of their business card or whatever, and to shoot it differently. Um, I also think this is really interesting with like circus shows in general, that there's yeah. kind of this thing that's happening where it's like, well, but you're shooting it as if I'm just an audience watching it live, which isn't the way that we consume film. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I mean, and that was the whole thing with on pen. I don't know if you saw it. I haven't seen um, it yet. I want okay. to. Where can I go see it? Where can the audience go see it? Well, okay. So we just had a run um, at the culture in Vancouver and they released it online and it was awesome. They had, I think it was like five shows total, um, but we're going to be releasing it in France and Quebec soon. Like no set date has been released. Um, okay. But that was like, basically we had, you know, like my personal vision on what film or circus film is and what it's trying to capture. Like I have my own sort of process or things that I think are important in a circus film. Um, and it's exactly like you said, I mean, so much of circus is filmed from me sitting in a seat, just like I was in a theater. And I think what's so liberating about film is that there is no seat. Like the seat is wherever you want to put it. The audience is wherever you want to put it. Now all of a sudden you have control over what the audience sees or doesn't see. So why not take advantage of that? Like that's that's one of the ama most amazing things about film. And like I said, like I'm self-taught, so like I didn't go to school for it. And you know, so some of the things that I say, like I don't know technical terms really in, in the film industry. Um, I don't really know anything about the industry. <laughs> I just sort of focus myself like on visually what I like. Um, so I really just try to focus on that. Um, and one of the things the fingers really let me develop was like my my sort of philosophy of filming is like I want to because I'm so process based. I want to capture the vibe that I'm filming when I'm there with them, and because I'm an acrobat first. I really want to be in the room and I really want to be holding the camera, moving and breathing with the artist and trying to understand what they're trying to say through what they're doing. And also trying to like, keep in mind, like I always try to keep in mind the vibe of the room so that when I edit later, I'm able to translate and communicate the same vibe and intention they had when I was in the room filming them myself. Wow. And I edit with the same intention. So that way it's like, if it's, I try to capture that same in the editing, how it felt or how I felt when I was filming it. And I just, just something that like, I really like, I feel like I want to give, you know, cause in skateboarding so much, it's like they're, they're filming it in the streets and it's often like the, the skate videographer is skateboarding next to the artist or next artist, sorry, the skateboarder. <laughs> You know, I, think sure. I think they're artists yeah. yeah yeah for sure i do too um and they're you know like i grew up with that like you know skating behind a skater and filming them and getting right in there and oh, yeah or you know and i was like i want to i want to do that in circus i want to be right there wow. with the artists and i want to be dodging their tricks and i want to climb up on the pole and film them from above i want to sort of and when oh, I started yeah. doing that and when they started giving me that liberty to experiment with that, like my mind got blown. Cause I was like, this gives me the same feeling when I was on stage. Like, it's crazy. I was like, this is crazy. Like I'm motivated and I'm like hungry and whatever I'm feeling right now, like I want to keep doing that as long as I can, because all of a sudden, not only do I get to be on, on stage with the artists but i get to feel the same things they're feeling and i get to move with them and i get to be aware of them and then it also satisfies the fan in me mm. because now all of a sudden because i've always been a fan of circus and of tricks and of you know how superhuman circus is now i get to capture that in what i think is the best way possible and then i get to deliver that to the world because then I get to say, this is how circus, this is how I think circus should look. And this is what the circus artists today are doing. That's so incredible. And so I just, I mean, yeah, like, obviously, like everybody has their own sort of vision of how circus should be filmed and things like that. But I think what's so cool is that this, the fingers really gave me liberty to develop sort of what I think circus should look like.
Well, yeah. And I mean, like, you know. like you're saying, like everybody has, well, maybe not everybody has, but <laughs> there are people who have visions or ideas about like how circus should be filmed, what it should look like. But yeah. what you have that's so cool and unique, like you're saying, is that you have a company behind you who's like, you've got a vision. Let's make it reality. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah. And, it, and what's so cool is like, you know, a lot of people, you know, they ask how the process is for sometimes for filming and what I love about what I do with video at the fingers is it's really about, you know, I have conversations with the directors and I say, okay, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do here? What's your intention there? What's your motivation behind this? It's really, it's, it's really empowering that they would trust me to capture their intention and motivation, how I think it should look, yeah, you know? Absolutely. So it's like, and then it's a process because what's, what's, what's great is because the communication is so open between me and the artistic directors at the company is that, you know, we sit there together and we discuss a lot like the editing and we, and we change things around and we manipulate stuff and, and we mm. try to identify like what works in this scene, what doesn't work in this scene. Okay. Let's try to get that. And so it's like so much of my work at the fingers is hands on, you know, mm. um, that I really don't do much paperwork there. It's, it's very much about the the process and being creative and, trying new things and experimenting especially like you said because we are taking a shift i mean the show on pen we were supposed to play in the at the at the tohu they like gave us a tent and we had all these things set up where we were going to sell real estate so people could like buy seats and be two meters apart but we're going to sell like real estate so like little rugs so like people would buy like a rug and then you could sit on the rug and watch the show and then the government changed the rules and so the fingers were like all right well i guess we're going to shift gears and we're going to make a film instead. Like, let's go for it. Let's do it. Um, unfortunately I didn't get to film it because like we had a quarantine situation in my house where I was like, I wasn't allowed to leave the house for a bit. So I didn't get to film it, but you know, we very much made that film with that intention of like the audience should breathe and move with the artists. That's so that's, cool. that's what we delivered. And so when I got all the footage, I was like, sweet, now I'm going to edit this thing, you know, with that in mind of like, the audience should not feel that they're just sitting there watching a captation of a show that the audience very much gets and feels each character and the emotion. You know, one thing that one of the cameramen, Fred, um, he really told me, he was like, you know, and he, he went to school, I think for directing, if I'm not mistaken for film. Um, and he talked to me about, he's like emotional editing. There's something called emotional editing. And I started doing some research on it and I was like, yeah, like, that's it. Like, that's, that's what I've been doing for a long time without realizing is like, I very much try to pay attention to how does the editing make you feel, you know, like it could be a cool trick. It could be a cool. This, it could be amazing location. It could be all these things. But as a viewer, am I sucked into the emotional aspect of what I'm looking at. Absolutely. Um, and I try to pay as much attention as I can to that because I think the simplest clip can be very emotional if edited correctly. You know, um, totally. whereas I also think the most amazing visual can be edited without any emotion and you don't feel any connection to it, which I think also comes from sort of my experience creating with the fingers of like trying to celebrate the artists and trying to show the best face of every artist and the best side of those artists um and try to get the audience to relate to them even if on paper they don't relate to each other and i love i i have to say i do love what you're saying about editing i had a friend the other day who sent me um some of her footage of a new thing she made and she's like mm -hmm. I, I don't know i just and i was like did you edit this she was like, yeah. And I was like, do you like editing? And she's like, no. And I was like, okay, well, go send it to your friend in San Francisco who edited yeah. your last video that you loved. And like, because yeah. your job as an artist is done. Now another mm -hmm. artist has to step in and like do their job, you know? And I yeah. think that that's, yeah, no, I feel you. Um, okay. But final question, <laughs> which is, and you've given so much great advice already, but what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? The beginning of my career? Yeah, I know. Like, when is that? Um, I think just to always enjoy it. I mean, I, I, it's funny because, like, I grew up with a teacher, Lu Yi, who we had a saying at the end of every training, um, which we would say, Sher Fu Shao, like, thank you very much. Ching Chu Kule, like, training is bitter. <laughs> um, and so it's was, it was sort of instilled in me pretty early on that, like, training is always going to hurt. Um, 
But I think at some point, you know, later on in my career, when I had to transition out of performing, because I just, you know, for me, performing just became, even though, and, that, and that's what was hard because it was towards the end of Traces where I was really struggling with, you know, the eight shows a week, the touring, the repetitiveness of the doing the same thing and the same show over and over again, where at some point I had to sort of say out loud and recognize that like I could be in the best show, which I, you know, at that point I felt like I was, I was in a really good show, standing ovations every night. I could be in the most amazing city and the most amazing theater. And I didn't want to be there. Why? Like, why don't I want to be here? Like, this is crazy. And then on top of that, then I also came to the realization that I was like, well, if I don't want to be here, I need to give this opportunity and experience to somebody else who does want to be here because that's not fair to them. I'm taking their spot. And so I started to come to terms with, I need to transition out and figure out what circus means to me and why don't I like this? And so then I, I did kind of identify that of like, you know, it's funny in the beginning of this whole podcast, I was talking about running away with the circus. And so then all of a sudden, I, 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 I feel like to a certain extent, I, I wanted to run away to sort of life and like what I felt life was and what was, you know, what was important to me. And at that time, like I was in love with my wife and I wanted to be with her every day and every day I wasn't with her like it was just killing me and then I was also like I didn't want to do the same show anymore over and over again I was like this is like a desk job all of a sudden like while I'm doing choreography why am I thinking about like what I'm going to have for dinner or what movie I want to watch later I want to be in the moment again and so I really just I I left circus to go like I said earlier I went to be a bartender went to Concordia to be an independent student but I found it. I found life. I found like being with my, my girlfriend every day was amazing. And, and then having like a steady group of friends I was you know seeing every week and hanging out with, I was like, this is incredible. And I was like, I wonder if like where circus, what, what it will be for me? Like, wh- am I done with it or what? And then I told you the fingers gave me that random job in Rotterdam. So I went there, started teaching circus. And I was like, I fell in love with it two seconds. I was like, fuck, circus is the shit. Like circus is so cool. Like it's amazing. Not only do we get to learn tricks, but we get to challenge ourselves artistically and use our upbringing and like I said, experience and put that into our shows. We get to you know, do random things, not just disciplines, but kind of whatever we want. So teaching for a full year, like basically doubling down on what I felt circus should be and what my philosophy of circus is, having to teach that. So not only do I have my own thing in my head, but now I have to express this is what I believe and say it out loud, which was daunting at first. But then the more I said it, the more I believed it. And the biggest advice I learned from that, I mean, I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. Circus can always be what you want it to be. Like you don't need circus to be a circus artist. And that was the one thing that I learned was like, I'm in circus because I want to be here. I'm not stuck. You know, it's not a necessity. And one thing I I saw a lot of Chinese and what my teacher was telling us about, you know, like circus for survival versus circus for passion. And for us, you know, I remember my teacher telling me a story once of, you know, a contortionist in China who, you know, moved to the States, was doing her contortion act and and then randomly like something happened that she got injured. She couldn't do contortion anymore. Then she got a job at some random place. It was like there's something really monotonous. I think it was like, I don't know, I want to say like bagging groceries or something at a grocery store. But she expressed to him that she had never been happier. And I was like, I remember as a kid thinking like, there's no way, you know? And then when I experienced it, when I left Circus, you know, there was a lot of blowback from a lot of my friends and other artists in the community telling me like, you know, you made a huge mistake. Like, that I'm so sorry for you that you can't do Circus or you don't do Circus anymore. Or you're not a performer. But at the end of the day, I felt so liberated that I didn't need it to feel fulfilled. And that was my whole issue with it was like, if I love it so much, I want to be here because I choose to be here not because I'm stuck. And ever since I I realized that, that I don't need it to feel fulfilled, but that I'm here because I want to be here. And I'm in circus because I, like I said, I'm just a fucking huge fan of what people do and what people are capable of. I was like, now I'm going to be here for the rest of my life because it's on my terms. It's on nobody else's. I love that. Yeah. That's why I started the podcast, actually. 
Is it? Similar reasons. Yeah, why I started the whole artist athlete is because I was like, I I don't know how long the performing is going to be. I don't know if I want to be traveling all the time. I don't know, you know, like kind yeah. of the same thing. I, I quit circus for about a year and after yeah. I broke up with a guy and I was like, I don't know what life is going to be. And so I like wrote an ebook to kind of help with aerial technique. Yeah. And I started selling that. And then I, and someone was like, you should have a podcast because you love podcasts and you yeah. have a voice for it. And I was like, okay, I don't know. how You do have works, an amazing you... voice for podcasting. Thank you. <laughs> I went to New York University for theater. So I have a very strong non-regional dialect. Amazing. But yeah. <laughs> no, and then, but it is really like, like, so what you're saying echoes on a very personal level where I'm like, yeah, like I'm still, I still go and I train with Victor and I like, yeah, know, do what I love because I love to do it. But um, that's it. And, and, and you know, and it's it. nothing yeah. against anybody that chooses to do, you know, what I, what was difficult for me, you know, I was very jealous of the people that could tour for 20 years I'm because sorry. I didn't understand. I was like, why, why can't I love this? Why am I having such a hard time with it? But then I, like I said, like I, I came to that realization. It was like, no circus is what you make it out to be. Yeah. And I was like, it's cool. Done. <laughs> Figured it out. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So that's my biggest advice for circus artists. Just so really good. try to figure out what circus means to you and why you're doing it. And then try to make, mold it into what you think circus is, not yeah. what somebody else tells you to do. You know, just because you're good at it doesn't mean you have to do it. <sighs> that's very good too. That's very good too. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that was a lot of the comments I got. Yeah. People were telling no, me, but you're totally so good that. at it. It's so sad that you stopped. It's like, just because you're good at it, you know, it's it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on today, Francisco. This was so no fun to fill or to record. I really appreciate it. That was really fun. I want to ask you something too. Yeah. I don't know. We can. That was part one of my interview with Francisco Cruz. We took a break there, so I figured it would be a good time to take a break for you all as well. We'll pick up with part to next week where we get into a lot more of the real life story and a lot more of the questioning topics about filming circus for video rather than performing, which I think is a pretty relevant topic right now, and so much more. In the meantime, if you want to check out Francisco's work, he's pretty awesome. He's on Instagram. He's pretty awesome. You know, he's pretty cool. And he's on Instagram at filmed by Francisco, all one word. And the company that he mentions oh so often is at the, and then the number seven fingers. For aerial training tips and inspiration, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at the underscore artist underscore athlete. My Facebook is the artist athlete. My website is the artist athlete.com. Are we seeing a trend? I think yes. And patreon.com slash the artist athlete is the place to go to support this episode of the podcast and every single episode of the podcast every week. Talk at you next week, friends, fans, and foes. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, my name is Noah and I do hand balancing. Hi, my name is Woody and I do Leo walk. Thank you for listening to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Hi, I'm Freya. You can hear my whole story in episode 50 of the Artist Athlete Podcast, but I'm here to tell you about something else that I do. I'm a qualified health and nutrition coach. I help people with sleep and body confidence, among other things. You can see everything I have to offer at wildguidance.com or follow me on Instagram at wildguidance. Hi everyone, I'm Dominique, a ground acrobat, trapeze artist, and coach, currently bringing circus to the extremely cold but very beautiful Northern Ontario, Canada. Circus has changed my life and I'm so grateful to everyone in this community. Find me on Instagram at domupsidedown or my website domupsidedown.com. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slack lining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. 
straps artist and lyra performer and acrobat out of greenville south carolina so if you're ever passing through make sure to stop in and see me and my friends we have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you hi my name is erica lee i'm from st louis missouri and i'm an aerialist i teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and sling and rope by night i really really like the artist athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And that's why I'm Patreon. Hello all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete Podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. And goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we've got a place for you. 